today, uh, we're here to talk about um, early voting and vote by mail. Uh, don't worry, we'll leave a lot of time for questions. Um, we will also make a video recording of this presentation um, uh, available after the webinar. Um, and if you have any issues, you can just drop them into the chat box for us. The agenda for today is we're going to do a quick introduction of the Our Homes, Our Votes project uh, that I do every month. Uh, for those of you who have come to enjoy it, it'll just be a nice update. Um, we'll talk a little bit about COVID-19 advocacy because indeed whenever people are gathered anywhere during these difficult times, uh, we should chat a little bit about COVID-19 and efforts to uh, address housing and homelessness needs uh, of the recession and the pandemic. Um, I'll talk a little bit about becoming an affiliate of Our Homes, Our Votes. I'll share about the Housing Providers Council, and then we'll get into our special topics, which are early voting and vote by mail. I'm really excited to have with me Maria Bruno, um, who is with the Coalition on Homelessness and Housing in Ohio, uh, where she is a civic engagement coordinator and policy analyst and uh, the leader of their work with the Ohio Votes Project and generally uh, an outstanding guru on housing organizations being involved in the election. Um, so to introduce you to Our Homes, Our Votes really briefly, many of you know this is our effort to increase voter registration and turnout among uh, low-income renters and their allies throughout the country. This involves three pieces. One, registering voters, then educating voters about how to vote, what to bring with them, what's on the ballot, and then mobilizing voters, partly on election day, though in an increasing amount of states before election day through early voting, no excuse absentee voting, voting or vote by mail. We do this for uh, a pretty simple reason. We want to address the disparity be in voter uh, turnout between renters and homeowners. And as you can see on this graph, there's usually about a 20% disparity uh, between renters and homeowners. And that disparity is even greater, in fact, when you look at uh, income levels. People with ho households with incomes below 20,000 are much less likely to vote than household incomes over 100,000. In elevating low-income renters and their needs in the election, we have the support of the overall electorate. 83% of the public agrees that elected officials are not paying enough attention to the cost of housing and the need for more affordable housing. 76% they are, say they are more likely to vote for a candidate who has a detailed plan for making housing more affordable. I'm gonna break now from Our Homes, Our Votes just to chat really quickly about coronavirus and what's happening uh, with our ongoing advocacy there. Uh, first, many of you are aware that we have uh, some really specific asks for Congress right now. Um, we're working toward 100 billion in emergency rental assistance, uh, a comprehensive national eviction moratorium, and $11.5 billion in emergency solutions grant. I'm seeing a lot of uh, blinking lights in the chat box, so I'm gonna quickly pause and take a look to see if I'm having some kind of audio problem, and then we will proceed. Um, Okay, looks like everything's good. Um, so, uh, August 24th, we are holding a day of action. This is in fact the upcoming Monday. This is the day when uh, after the exp uh, expiration of the federal eviction moratorium almost a month ago, uh, landlords covered under federal housing funding are eligible to um, evict tenants. Uh, they needed to give a 30 day notice. So NL NLIHC is partnering with the Coalition on Human Needs to call on Congress to hashtag get back to work and return to their negotiations. Um, our day of action resources are all available on the website and uh, we'll drop those in the chat box. I'm sorry they're not on the slide. Um, and then we'll also have media guidance and sample tweets, uh, a story banking form. And I wanna specifically emphasize uh, the power of stories right now as it relates to advocacy around the coronavirus because too many members of Congress and indeed media outlets are growing skeptical that we will in fact have a tsunami of evictions based on people who have lost income due to this uh, virus and the, uh, the recession. Um, the fact of the matter is landlord behavior uh, follows the ability of people to pay for their housing. And all of our estimates show that there's going to be a true surge of eviction unless we do something in a preventative manner because addressing evictions uh, will always be easier and more cost effective if we do so before they happen. We also have uh, talking points on all of our policy asks uh, that will be available for the day of action. 
But uh, the Natural Disaster and Emergency Ballot Act is something that you might be, want to follow. Uh, this is Senate Bill 3529, introduced by Senators Amy Klobuchar and Ron Wyden. It ensures that all voters in all states have the option to request absentee balloting. It requires at least 20 days of early voting in all states. And it provides $3 million to the Election Assistance Commission to begin implementing all of the requirements of the Act. Um, there are obviously shifting rules. Uh, in many of your states right now for early voting, vote by mail, and voter registration. Um, please take a look at the state-by-state -state pages at ourhomes.r-votes.org when we'll update, um, where we'll be updating uh, these changes moving forward. Uh, all right. Oh, I lost my slideshow. I can't figure out why. Sorry, one second. Technology and the pandemic, am I right? All right, back on my slide. I was back on my slides. I seem to have lost my slides. All right. Are we back? Looks like we're back. Okay. So um, stay aware of what's happening in your state and please also consider joining Our Homes, Our Votes as a local affiliate. This helps us know who's doing what throughout the country. Uh, being an affiliate isn't any sort of um, stringent requirement on any of you. It just gets you some t-shirts, stickers, and buttons. You get to use the Our Homes, Our Votes logo and co-branded materials, like, materials like posters and flyers and so forth, so forth. And we'll also amplify any of your local efforts through our social media, our blog, and our regular Our Homes, Our Votes e-newsletter. You'll also have access to guidance from NLIHC staff. Uh, let's get to the matter at hand today and talk a little bit about early voting and vote by mail. First, be aware that 200 million Americans can vote early. Depending on your state, it might not apply uh, directly to you, but most states allow an early voting option. Um, this ensure, ensures that Americans don't have to choose between their health and their civic duty. Um, voting early allows for greater social distancing and fewer people to cram into a polling site at any given time on any given day. Um, busy schedules and long lines often prevent voters from casting their ballots, and early voting makes it easier for campaigns who are encouraging people to vote to do so over a longer period than just one day. Through early voting, get out the vote is often a matter of several weeks and not just a one-day affair. Voting, voter registration, of course, is only half the story. So many of our campaigns focus on registering low-income voters and, and boosting their uh, presence on voter rolls. But if they don't actually make it to the polls, or if they don't actually submit a mail-in ballot, their registration is less useful. We need to make sure that registrants are actually voting. Uh, a factoid here is that 70% of Americans are registered to vote, but only 50% of Americans actually turned out in the last midterm election. Americans like early voting. 40% of voters uh, have already voted early in the past. Uh, they like having options, and polling shows us that. And people respond really well to safe and secure election, uh, which is more likely uh, when early voting is available. Vote early options are increasing rapidly and have been for several years, and up until very recently had um, bipartisan support. So uh, learning from other uh, national events like National Voter Registration Day or Giving Tuesday, there is this year a vote early day where organizations such as yours throughout the country are being actively encouraged to plan events around voting early um, and uh, calling on people to, uh, to go to the, pool, the early polls together um, and do so on October 24th, um, which will be uh, eligible uh, in every state that has early voting available. So uh, these, uh, the early voting day is being uh, coordinated by a very large coalition of several national organizations. Um, and we encourage all of you uh, to visit the website and to be involved. Uh, with that, I'd like, it, like to turn it over to my co-presenter, uh, Maria Bruno, uh, who has a lot of uh, really helpful uh, tips and thoughts to share about what they've been doing with Ohio Votes. Uh, so Maria, take it away. All right, thank you. And thank you so much for having me. Um, so my name is Maria Bruno. I work with COHIO, which is the Coalition on Homelessness and Housing in Ohio. 
Um, and one thing Cohio realized as an organization is that we have all of this access to low income and underserved communities through our network of direct service and housing organizations. Uh, and, we, and these are also those populations of folks who, as Joey just mentioned, aren't necessarily being reached by, you know, political campaigns. Um, one thing that we tend to focus on is, you know, generally political campaigns focus on uh, likely voters who agree with them, and we focus on unlikely voters and we're not asking them if they agree with us. Um, but we are entirely nonpartisan and 501c3 compliant, and we have a network of partner organizations that help us uh, reach low income and disenfranchised communities. Next slide, please. Sorry about that, there you go. <laughs> So there are three different options to uh, vote in, and I, you know, some of this I know is very state specific. So I'll try to qualify things that are state specific um, as much as I can, and just know that you know you'll have to look up the rule for your individual state. But there are a lot of national uh, resources that kind of already have the the summary rules for each of the different states and the differences. So. Um, you know, if you can find one of those, you don't have to do too much legwork. But in Ohio, we have in-person early voting for actually uh, about 29 days uh, before the actual election day. Uh, we have in-person on election day, and we have vote by mail absentee voting, which uh, contrary to public uh, messaging, are the exact same thing. Um, and so in Ohio, we have no fault absentee voting, which means that we can vote by mail um, for any reason. We don't have to you know, qualify it with a particular type of need. So COVID has affected the 2020 election in a handful of, of ways, and I'm sure many of these will sound familiar to you. Uh, precinct worker shortages are the biggest one. You know, a lot of uh, folks for a lot of different states, the precinct workers are often the folks who are retired uh, or otherwise, you know, in high risk categories. So we've really had to expand out our recruitment for pre precinct worker shortages. Uh, in Ohio, there's been, you know, they're offering CLE credits. I just read that they're offering continuing learning credits for accountants. So they're really trying to loop in some folks to motivate them to cover that shortage. Uh, there's generally increased stress on mail-in voting. Uh, and obviously the U USPS controversies don't help, uh, but just generally it's, you know, a different set of tasks for the boards of elections actually running the election. It's a different, you know, way of counting the votes. It's a different uh, intake method. And so, you know, this, this sudden move over to uh, vote by mail is a little bit of a, a planning process for the boards themselves to process that. Uh, a lot more uh, confusion about rules, dates, and locations. Uh, Ohio, uh, some of you might be familiar with, had their primary actually all of the polling locations closed as of 10 p.m. the night before election day. And then we had an extra month to do mail-in ballots and we didn't have in-person uh, voting for the majority of folks. So needless to say, for this year, the general, uh, a lot of folks are really confused about what the rules are, are going to be for the general. But our, our general, as of right now, is going to look very similar to the average general election, just with um, some more safety accommodations. Also, potential for short notice changes. Um, our Secretary of State is actually working very hard to create deadlines so that folks cannot, you know, the night before the election, say we have three poll workers and that's not enough. Um, so they are requiring some notice so that they can accommodate any poll worker shortages, but there's still a potential for shortages, which means they could consolidate polling locations. Um, and, you know, also this affects Ohio votes operations in a number of ways. The biggest is, you know, as we made plans six months out, it um, really became important for us to have two sort of parallel plans. One, if people are allowed to be in public, and two, if everyone's still virtual everything. Uh, so we've had to adapt to a lot of digital options for outreach um, and also increase training for our organizers, both, both on the voting tools that we're using, such as uh, through talk and outvote and some other text banking programs, um, but also on the rules around uh, vote by mail. There are some weird, maybe um, not so intuitive rules around who can turn in things for who and what the deadlines are and when things are mailed out. So. Uh, we've really had to up our game on that training as well. And I mentioned the moving target for planning purposes, just 
always kind of ready for the city to shut down uh, tomorrow. So that just creates a level of planning that we certainly have not had to do in the past. And we have previously done rides to the polls, which we are not, we officially have decided that we will not be conducting, but we uh, will be doing a how-to guide for smaller organizations that decide to take that, um, that up themselves. So we have a lot of random volunteers and smaller organizations interested in doing that. Uh, we just on a statewide level really can't uh, put the safety measures in place that we would like to feel comfortable to ex uh, execute that program. Uh, next slide, please. So these are Ohio specific rules. I do want to say this and they will very um, specifically um, change from state to state. So I just kind of wanted to show the questions that we tend to get from the direct service and housing organization. Uh, the first is, can we pay for postage? So this, we've actually asked for specific clarification from the Attorney General's Office of Ohio. Um, and generally, it kind of depends on who you ask, whether they say it's legal, but uh, we as a nonprofit organization working with direct service and housing organizations have gone ahead and moved forward with the understanding that if it isn't uh, explicitly, you know, not um, not all right, then we're going to keep doing it until someone tells us not to. Um, but we think that there is a very legitimate interpretation of the current law that allows us to prepaid postage. Um, but it is a point of uh, confusion for a lot of nonprofits. Another is can we mail or drop off ballots for voters, which is very similar. In Ohio, we actually have different rules for ballot request forms and actual ballots. Uh, ballot request forms have to be mailed, but uh, you can still collect them and turn them in for other people. Uh, whereas the, the actual ballot can only be turned in by a, an immediate family member. Uh, so that obviously is something that we have to train really hard on because it's, again, not particularly intuitive, um, but that is the rule. And then providing a ride to vote or a ride to the drop box to allow folks to return their own absentee ballot, totally good. Um, and again, this is for Ohio but uh, those are some common concerns that we get. Um, so just some considerations. So I know there's been a huge push to, to push vote by mail and in a lot of ways, that's really great. Um, and it is a really good option for a lot of people, um, but it also is sometimes not the option for people. So it's important to just look at the pros and cons so that when you are talking to folks, you're also aware of maybe the downside of just uh, you know, forwarding everyone to the vote by mail, uh, you know, system. So um, obviously the pros are you can avoid the general interaction with most people, which is, of course, during COVID, probably the main um, benefit. You can also take care of your ballot request now. Again, this is in Ohio, but I don't know how it is in other places uh, to get ahead of the curve. So you can actually put your ballot request form now and they'll mail out the ballot starting October 5th. Um, and so, you know, you can kind of check that off your list and know that you'll get a ballot in the mail and then return it um, then. But technically, you can also request a, a ballot up until very late, um, but I'll get to that in the cons. Uh, also, making a plan to vote increases voter turnout generally. So, you know, requesting an absentee ballot sort of also functions as making a plan to vote. Um, so this is one way to do that. And at least in Ohio, absentee voting and voting in person early, uh, all you need as far as an ID goes is the last four digits of your social security number. Whereas if you wait for election day, you have to have an additional form of ID. So for folks who are transient, homeless, housing insecure, or otherwise have issues with getting the um, IDs allowed on election day, this is a really good option for them because they won't have to worry about that at all. Again, that's Ohio. Um, but the cons are that there's a really a low degree of trust in the mailing system, especially right now. Um, and also, you know, there have been a lot of delays in mail. It's taken, you know, a month to get something four miles down the road. That's not, a, you know, that's not something to, to overlook, um, but it sounds like they are working out some kinks now. Um, it also can be an onerous task to get to a drop box or to find a postage stamp or envelope. Some of you might live in states where they provide prepaid postage and, with, and a return envelope, in which case this is much less of an issue. Um, or you might have multiple drop boxes. But in general, uh, you know, in Ohio, we only have one drop box per county, which means that still could be, you know, a 
two hour bus ride to get to that drop box. So if you don't trust the mail system and you don't have a stamp um, or you can't get to the drop box, you know, that's where providing rides and things like that can fill that gap. Um, people also with the increased promotion of vote by mail kind of thought that maybe there had been a change to the in-person, especially after our sort of very confusing uh, primary, a lot of folks were like, well, is voting in person on election day still an option? And which it absolutely is. So just make sure, you know, if you're promoting vote by mail, you're also letting people know about the other options. Um, just because of the process of requesting an absentee ballot, it's more steps, which means there's more chances of mistakes. Um, and there's also more volunteer training, you know, an incomplete form, uh, you know, two rounds there and back in the mail to send your form, get the form back or get the ballot back, mail the ballot again. Um, each one of those, you know, you leave a box empty, you leave insufficient postage, uh, the uh, Board of Elections decides your signature doesn't match. There's a bunch of different reasons that that can be uh, just setting yourself up for more potential to um, accidentally disenfranchise voters. Um, again, just in Ohio, voters are not alerted if their if their ballot does not sort of get processed or uh, count for any number of reasons. And that could be, for example, that their signature didn't match, that they left a key key part of the form blank. Uh, there's a lot of different reasons. But if you vote by mail, you won't necessarily know um, whether your your ballot was counted, which is um, not nothing. And then a voter might change their mind about mailing or about voting by mail. And so then they might try to vote in person. Uh, you know, that can create a bureaucratic headache for a lot of folks. Again, just in Ohio, uh, they will let you vote in person provisionally. And then once they've confirmed that you haven't also turned in the uh, mail-in ballot, then your vote will count by normal. We also have some boards of elections, and I don't think all, are taking the initiative to, if folks request an absentee ballot, but then decide to vote early in person, they're actually gonna cancel that request right on the spot and let that person vote a regular ballot. Uh, next slide, please. Is that all I have? I'm not sure. Yeah, I think the next slide is okay. questions. Great. Um, <laughs> Great. So I, I, I wanna throw it over to questions and frankly, I'm expecting there will be a lot of them because there's been so much conversation recently about uh, vote by mail, uh, which is not a political issue at all. Uh, but has sort of become one due to coronavirus and um, President Trump's concerns about what he would call voter fraud, but is surely um, his concern about high voter turnout. Um, so uh, take a second and put questions into the chat box. I do want to follow up about one thing specifically that Maria shared about, which is, is it legal to provide someone with a stamp to, uh, to let them vote? Now, the reason this is a question, and, and some of you might know this, is it's illegal to provide anyone with an incentive to vote, but you can't use an inducement of any material or monetary reward, right? Um, so this applies to things like an election night party. Um, we're gonna have a pizza party in the community room, and if you have an I voted sticker, you get in, you get free pizza. Or maybe at a bar, they wanna give a free beer to everyone who wears an I voted sticker. Uh, that's illegal. Uh, voters and non-voters have to be treated alike. You can have an election night party, but there can't be anything that's just available for voting. Um, the difference between a pizza party or a free beer and a ride to the polls is a ride to the polls is not a reward for voting. Um, it is in fact a, uh, uh, an offer to, to allow someone to vote who otherwise might not be able. Yeah, exactly. Now, the reason the stamp gets a little bit complicated is that a stamp has actual cash value of something like 50 cents. I don't even know right now. And so the idea is if you give someone a stamp, they might use it for any number of things. Um, and as a result, this could be an inducement. Um, I believe, uh, as Maria's interpretation is, providing someone with a stamp simply enables them to vote. It allows them to vote. Um, and this is not a reward for voting. And frankly, I'm not aware of any example anywhere where somebody got in trouble for providing stamps. I'm aware of several examples of people getting in trouble for providing other things as a reward for voting, um, but stamps surely um, help, help um, uh, ballots get counted, right? And that, that ultimately is the goal of our efforts. 
Um, I want to. And, and another thing just to note too about that is, um, you know, not only is it not an inducement to vote, but because most of you folks are at nonprofits, you know, often one of the services being provided is, is facilitating folks to send an email. Um, so even, you know, if you provide a stamp for uh, your application for Medicaid, um, you know, obviously that's not an inducement to apply, apply for Medicaid. Um, so the, you know, there's an additional sort of argument that not only is it facilitation, but also in your normal line of business, this is really in line with your mission and what you otherwise do. I think that's a great point, thank you. Um, one question has jumped in about, uh, well, first, uh, a question from Jewel about whether or not uh, the PowerPoint slides will be sent out. Yes, they will. Um, and uh, I also have a question about, oh, um, interpreters and access to um, uh, ballots in other languages or um, ballots uh, available to people who have visual impairments and so forth. Um, so we covered accessibility issues and voting during our uh, June webinar. So I encourage any of you to go and uh, take a look at that webinar and a lot of the great information that was included. Uh, but you should know that uh, polling locations will have ballots in additional languages, but uh, polling locations will never have ballots in all languages. Um, most states and most communities will offer uh, ballots in alternative languages for the most commonly spoken non-English languages in the community. Um, and again, that's most states and most polling locations. Uh, there are some states that actually do have an English-only standard, uh, which is very, very unfortunate, of course. Um, there are uh, a lot of great people at the Hispanic Federation um, and uh, uh, Latino Victory Project who are working specifically on Spanish language access ballots. Um, and then the National Council on Independent Living has some resources on uh, ballot access for people who have um, visual or hearing disabilities as well. Um, I'm looking for... It, um, I'm sorry, I was just going to add to that too, is it actually can even vary by county. So in Ohio, um, the threshold for um, providing uh, different languages other than English is that they have a certain percentage of their population that speaks that language. So we're actually uh, working right now with folks uh, in the Youngstown area who has, have had an increase in their Hispanic population but still has not reached that threshold. And so they're worried about ballot at, um, access for that. That being said, all of our um, handicap standards or disability standards uh, are statewide. So it, you know, it can depend on the state, it can depend on the county, it can de depend on the specific issue. Um, thanks for sharing that. And it's important if you are an advocate for certain communities that have language needs or certain disability needs, that you're in touch with your county clerk or your local board of elections um, to try to work out those issues prior to election day. Um, Zachary Hollander from California posted a really important question. Um, California is a state that's doing automatic vote by mail. Uh, for folks who are experiencing homelessness who put cross streets for the address portion of their registration, will they still have to vote in person? Um, and so uh, thanks for this question. Uh, our webinar last month in July was all about um, voting without an address, and it focused really specifically, as it always has, about um, how to register to vote. But we actually didn't get into the fact that uh, many uh, states this year, there will be no um, way to vote in person, right? Um, so the answer to your question, Zachary, is the challenge will be not um, how to vote, um, because, uh, of course, a person who is homeless, if they have a ballot in their name, can still submit that ballot through the mail. They just need to receive that ballot somewhere, right? So um, what, what California has, and I'll try to look it up and put it in the chat box, is a place where voters can go to request a ballot. Um, this is if uh, someone's requesting a ballot be sent to an address that is other than the address that they're voting at, uh, registered at. Uh, maybe they're staying with relatives during the pandemic or something like of that nature. Um, but it can also be for people who are homeless. And so if a person who is homeless uh, has a place where they accept, where they receive mail, whether it's a shelter or a relative's house, and so forth, um, they can go online uh, and request a ballot be mailed to that address. 
they can then get the ballot with their regular mail and then submit it through the mail like anyone else would. Um, thank you for that important question. I don't know, Maria, do you have anything else to add on that? Um, not really. I would just say, you know, in Ohio, and again, this is very state specific, but in Ohio, we work with the local nonprofits to allow them to use their address so that they can receive mail. And that's within the law uh, in this state, uh, which can solve a lot of the logistical concerns behind that, but, you know, still relies on the, on the voter going back to get that mail. Great. Thank you. Um, another question uh, that's come up um, so this is interesting. Um, Maria, in Ohio, you're not allowed to collect ballots unless you're a relative. Um, but do you encourage um, people to, instead of putting their ballots through the mail, because the post office might be slow, to in fact take them to the ballot boxes or to the local offices where ballots can be dropped off and received? Great question and reasonable minds will differ, but um, for us, yes, the drop boxes I think are incredibly helpful in, you know, closing that gap of trust, especially again, given all of the dialogue around the USPS right now. Um, that being said, it's a lot less accessible if there's only one for the whole county. So. Uh, frankly, we tend to just err on the side of giving people options. Ideally, you can, you know, help facilitate whatever way it makes sense for that person to be turning in ballots um, and then just kind of remind them of the rules and make them aware of where the ballot boxes are and, you know, what the dates are around the post office. So I do think that's, you know, the, the safest direct path to getting in the hands of the Board of Elections and certainly what we would advise folks to favor. Um, but, you know, the USPS is still an institution that is uh, responsible and things will get there, especially if you give adequate time. So, um, you know, we haven't, tr we've tried not to contribute to that um, sort of fear tactic that the USPS can't function anymore because it can, it just is a little bit slow. Great point. Thank you. Um, and I, I will add my perspective. I, I think Maria was saying, I think different campaigns will take different approaches. Um, my perspective is um, it's definitely best to drop off the ballot versus um, relying on the Postal Service. And I think that's true in any environment. Um, the Postal Service, any number of things can go wrong. We've all had things get lost in the mail before. Um, now, that's not to say that mail-in voting isn't reliable. It is, of course, very reliable but not as reliable as putting the ballot into a ballot drop-off box. So to the extent that you can promote that um, with the low-income renters or people in your network, it's definitely a better way to go because there's greater certainty the ballot will be um, I'm going to look for... I go ahead. I'm going to look for sorry, more questions. I was just also going to um, add related to that, um, that and now I'm forgetting my train of thought. You just said to do the drop boxes. Yeah, I'm definitely oh, no. more reliable. Yeah. To be honest, I forgot my comments. So move along and I'll put in the chat when I remember. <laughs> I'm pretty sure we can edit that out of the recording. I think you'll be fine. Um, we did have a, an update come in that in Rhode Island, uh, Kristen is posting that they won um, new in-person voting periods um, for town and city halls, uh, 20 days up to election day, which is really excellent for any early voting campaigns. Um, I gonna... remembered. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> uh, so in Ohio, we actually have an ability to track your ballot too. So if we do end up relying on the postal service, one thing that we will advise voters is to, to track it, whether that uh, request was received, whether the ballot was received, and they have you know, a tracking mechanism to do that, which adds a little bit of extra um, confidence in the system. Um, thank you everyone for your questions so far. Um, I do want to add that uh, one thing that, that we didn't cover yet in this presentation, but I just wanted to mention, because you might be hearing it in the news, um, mail-in voting and no excuse absentee voting are the same thing. And you should be aware of that. The only difference between um, no excuse absentee vote voting, which President Trump does uh, himself, and uh, many members of his family and cabinet and so forth do as well, 
The only difference between no excuse absentee voting and what's happening in California um, and places like Washington, Oregon, and Utah and Colorado is that in those states, the, the ballot is mailed to you automatically, whether you asked for it or not. And in the case of no excuse absentee balloting, you have to specifically request an absentee ballot. Generally, though, you shouldn't think that these two things are different um, as it comes up in the news and in popular conversation. Um, Mail-in voting and no excuse absentee voting are, are the same. There are some states, and you'll see this on the state-by-state -state pages of our website, that allow mail-in voting only if you have a specific reason. Um, you might be a soldier who is deployed, or you might be someone who's in the hospital and you can't get to or um, you might have work requirements that prevent you from getting to the polls. Uh, that's, that's pretty universal, absentee voting with a legitimate uh, reason. And the list of reasons varies a bit from state to state. Um, it really is the automatic universal mail-in voting uh, that's sort of the contentious political issue right now. Uh, Maria just posted in the chat that um, universal mail-in voting is how you refer to the states that, that uh, have folks automatically receive their ballots. Thank you for that. Um, looking for other questions. Uh, I'm gonna so ask about the signature comparison. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, so um, the question is if we're worried about the signature comparison step as in when someone is um, confirmed or matches their voter registration or BMV signature to the absentee ballot request. It's a method to, of course, you know, avoid uh, fraudulent applications. Um, and actually, yes, it's a huge problem. In Ohio, there's actually active litigation to um, confirm that uh, there is a better process because at least in Ohio, and I don't mean to scare you when I say this, but this is the reality. The folks who decide that don't have any specialized training, they are just employees at the BOE, and it's not necessarily uh, audited by the state uh, at this point. Um, so, you know, you can see how that would be sort of a messy process and subject to a lot of just random opinion. Um, so, yes, it is, it is a problem, um, and it's a problem with both provisional ballots as well as uh, absentee ballot request forms. Um, but also, you know, in theory, any ballot could be challenged if there is uh, enough of a discrepancy in the registration, which oftentimes means that if folks do have a change in signature, perhaps they had a brain injury or have, um, you know, um, hand limitations that make their hands a little shaky, uh, I would actually recommend that they reapply to or register to vote with their new signature just to avoid that headache. Thank you uh, for that really thorough and excellent answer, Maria. Really appreciate it. Um, also, there's a question in the chat box. Uh, was there a link to the California uh, residential address? Oh, um, so I'm trying to find a link on the California website to put into the chat. I might have to do it uh, in the follow-up notes that we send out to all attendees. Um, looking for additional questions. Oh, uh, Kristen uh, Langworthy from Rhode Island uh, chimes in with another update about uh, their recent victory in Rhode Island Common Cause um, versus Gorbea. Um, that uh, was a, a Supreme Court ruling um, defending a consent agreement uh, of the state waiving the signature of witnesses and notary requirements, uh, which is really big legal precedent that might be relevant to some of the work that some of you are doing. All right, oh, oh, all right, the slides started moving. Um, so feel free to continue to submit questions. Uh, I'm taking a look, uh, let's see here. Uh, for now, I'll just uh, share with you that we have our third Thursdays at three webinar and podcast series uh, wrapping up. It seems like it started uh, so long ago. This is in fact our 12th session and only three remain in the monthly sessions. Uh, we're going to do voter mobilization part two uh, in September. That's going to be about protecting voters against uh, voter intimidation uh, and perhaps voter caging uh, tactics. And then in October, we'll focus on election day. 
and getting out the vote and what election day will look like throughout America. Uh, and then in November, we are going to uh, talk about holding candidates to their promises. Uh, many of you know we did a couple of candidate engagement webinars earlier in the year. Uh, and then in November, we're going to wrap up to talk about ongoing engagement with candidates now that they are uh, elected officials. Oh, uh, Johnny Peace uh, just asked an important question in the chat box, which is, is the presentation on ballot initiatives still available? Um, so we had a technical difficulty with that recording and we're going to re-record the ballot initiative session and send out a new recording and paste a new one online. Um, we're going to try to have that done uh, hopefully by the end of next week and we'll make sure to um, send an email to all webinar uh, registrants and attendees when that recording becomes available. Uh, thanks for that question Johnny and I'm sorry it's not available right now. Uh, please become a member of the National Low Income Housing Coalition. Uh, membership supports our ongoing work on the Our Homes, Our Votes 2020 project. And uh, we appreciate any organization or individual becoming members at any uh, contribution rate they can afford. And then these are the housing advocacy orders, organizers on uh, NLIHC field team. You'll see an email address and a phone number for myself, uh, Brooke Shipwright, Tori Beret, and Kyle Arbuckle. Um, and you can reach out to us if you have any questions or if you'd like to be involved moving forward. Um, all right, any other questions before I wrap it up? I'm looking, going once, going twice. All right, seeing no other questions, I wanna thank you all for joining us today for this really important topic. Um, and I hope we, uh, we all connect very soon. Uh, look forward to the recording and the slides coming to you in a follow-up email in the next couple of days. All right. Bye, everyone. Bye.